I hope tonight you come pray. I hope tonight you come lifting me up. I hope tonight you come seeking something that will help. Acts chapter number 2, starting in verse number 46. Acts chapter 2, verse 46. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Father, as we come to you, I come to you needing help tonight. You have been so good to me and you blessed through the day and took care of me, supplied my needs, and gave me help and strength. You've allowed me to come back to the house tonight and I thank you for that and I thank you for each one of these that came out tonight. God, I appreciate their faithfulness to your house. God, I thank you most of all for saving me. I thank you for Jesus. Greatest gift to ever receive was salvation. And Father, I realize tonight that the only way to get that is through and by the Lord Jesus Christ. Please forgive me where I failed you and where I've let you down. God, I know tonight you can't use a dirty vessel. If there's anything between me and you, I pray, God, you take it away. Father, tonight, I thank you for the time in the prayer room, and I thank you for the songs that were sung. And I hope that everybody under the sound of my voice can truly say it is well with my soul. But God, it's preaching time now. And I'm standing where a man cannot stand alone. If you're not standing here, then God, there'll be no preaching done. I beg you for help tonight. I beg you for that touch and that fresh anointing. I beg you, God, for the right words to say. And I pray, God, for the right spirit in which to say it. I pray, God, that you'd help me to do exactly what you'd have done. But do not let me overstep my bounds. Go with us now through the service. Have your way. And Lord, for what you do, we'll thank you, we'll praise you, we'll give you the honor and the glory, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In Acts chapter 2, we see the creation of the church. We see in Acts chapter 1, where Jesus said, go back to Jerusalem and wait. He said, you'll receive power when the Holy Ghost has come upon you. They go back. You do the math right, they sit there in that upper room and they pray for ten days. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they're all together in one accord and with one mind sitting in that upper room and here's the sound of a mighty rushing wind filled the house and at that point, at that point, the church was born. Yeah. They didn't stay in that room. They went out into the city of Jerusalem. And they began to preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Here in this passage of Scripture, the day of Pentecost is done. They're getting along well. They're all coming together with singleness of heart, so they're still 
in unity in one mind and in one accord. And the Bible says in verse 47, praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. We do not see people getting saved like we did at one point. Amen. We can blame that on the devil if we want to. I have heard people take the scripture from First Thessalonians, no, Second Thessalonians, excuse me, and misapply it, talking about how the day of the, the Antichrist, the day of the son of perdition, will not happen until there come a great falling away first. We are seeing that falling away. And it is more than just people not coming into church. It is people who have been in church that are falling out. We're not only seeing a falling away of the people, we're falling away, seeing a falling away of the preaching of the truth. I, I know that during one of the nights of the revival meeting, I mentioned a couple of gentlemen that both of them were down in Tennessee now and told Brother Tony I was glad they were there in his neck of the woods and there was some got upset. That's all right. I, I don't, you know, I, I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm not trying to be mean. But you need to know who you're listening to. You need to know who's telling what. You need to know what the truth is. You need to know and hear what people are preaching. And so, you know, if you want to send your money to Tyler, send it. If you want to send it to Locke, send it. I didn't mention C.T. Towns for that night, but I'll go ahead and mention him tonight. You say, now wait a minute. No, you wait a minute. I've heard people talk about them big Burlington revivals, and as far as I'm concerned, it ain't no different than that Asbury pretend revival they had out in Kentucky back in the fall. Yep. You say, now, preacher, people were getting saved. People were what? From what? Half truths don't save your soul. That's right. One of the reasons there's a great falling away at the time we're living in right now is people do not want to hear the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. They want some watered down something like I was talking about this morning. Yeah. Right. We are living in a day and time and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. We have gotten to the point and I said we we are more about, well, preacher, I'm, I'm just going to live right in front of them. We were at a store yesterday, and Roger made the statement. I don't know, Dad was probably, he was back there at the beer cooler doing something. Well, they know pretty much what I do at the beer cooler. Y'all heard that too. But when you can't physically talk to somebody, you get the message out the way you can. Mm-hmm. And y'all, y'all know what I was doing, right? Uh, yeah. These go in the beer cartons. All right? Surprise when you get home. You get a coupon. <laughs> <laughs> but we are to the point now that there is very little one-on-one -on -one inviting people to church or telling people about Jesus. We're more of a, a lifestyle evangelism kind of thing and for the next few minutes, please just bear with me and don't get mad until I get done. A lot of churches in the day and time we're living in right now have developed a mentality of isolation. You say, what do you mean, preacher? Well, we're right here. We're right here. We'll sing here. We'll preach here. We'll pray here. We'll, we'll fellowship here. We'll worship here. But when it comes outside the walls, well, there's a time and place for everything and the place for all of that's in church. 
nothing. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I used to read about those Catholic monks who would gather together in those monasteries and they were almost hermits and they would get off by themselves and and, and they just and I understand you gotta get by yourself and get along with God occasionally. Mm-hmm. Right. But when you do, after you do, as brother David Maynard used to say, yeah, we're looking for the sweet by and by, but right now we're in the middle of the nasty now and now, mm-hmm. and sometimes you got to get out where everybody's at. Yep. Right. It's not enough just to stay. That's why when, when Peter said what he did, we can't stay on top of the mountain. Jesus said, we got to get down there where they at. Right. Amen. Right. And when we get to the point that we're wanting to just isolate ourselves, and be by ourselves, we're no different than when you go back to 1 Kings chapter, it's either 17 or 18, those prophets that Obadiah have hid in the caves and he's feeding. They're isolated. They're God's men. You say that they was they were scared and they was they was protected in that cave. Let me tell you something. They should have come out of that cave and surrounded Elijah and helped him when he was praying and going up against those prophets of Baal and the prophets of the grove. God help a preacher has to stand alone. And it should never happen. We come in contact with people every day who are lost and undone on their way to hell. And what are we doing about it? The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter... And again, yes, we're supposed to live right in front of people. We're supposed to live godly in this present world. We're to deny ungodliness, just as Titus chapter 2 said. However... If that's the only way we're trying to lead people to Christ, that might sound spiritual, but it ain't scriptural. Jesus even said in Matthew chapter 28, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always. You know what's your point? If they ain't coming in here, it's our place to go out yonder. And we ain't doing it. We ain't doing it. We want to... It's, it's nice to stay in a comfort zone. It's, it's like, don't get me wrong. At the end of the day, I like going to the house. I do. It's a safe place. I know you still have problems at home. You know, a, a water line will leak or, or the furnace might go out or something might happen. But at home, at least, thank God, you're around your own kind. Yeah. It's just like coming to church. You tell me all you want to and I'm just going to be ugly as sin right now. Tell me all you want to. You're baptized, born again, saved, sealed, and sanctified. But if you ain't got time for the house of God, you ain't got enough guts and God on you to get to heaven. Play hooky all you want to. It don't work. I ain't talking about it, you sick. We ain't going through all that again. Well, preacher, I'm just so tired. Bless your heart, honey. He told his disciples that and within just a couple of days when he went out to the Mount of Olives and before he ascended into heaven, the one thing he said, and again, I am not charismatic, I am not Pentecostal, and I assure the world ain't Calvinist, he said, you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. In other words, fellas, get out of your comfort zone. Get out of that upper room. Get out and tell people about Jesus. Yeah. Right. You know when they started? Mm-hmm. 
They bided their time and they stayed in Jerusalem until Stephen was stoned. The persecution started and then they got out and did what God wanted them to do. They was afraid to stay in Jerusalem so then they started spreading out. And if that took the persecution to get it done, way to go Lord. Send it to us. If the only way that we're going to tell people about Jesus, the only way we're going to witness to people is to have trouble, then bless God. Hey, God, do what you got to do. Yeah. Right. You preach, you have lost your mind. No, I think I finally found it. I think I finally found it. We got a van sitting down here. Mm -hmm. The tire's going to dry rot. Somebody ought to be driving that van. And finding some people. Well, preacher, you do it. Bless your heart. If ain't nobody else going to, I will. That's our job. Yep. That's our job. He said, well, preacher, you know, what if we used a tank of gas a week and didn't get but one person in the church house? Bless God. What's worth more, a tank of gas or a soul? Amen. Right. Amen. Amen. I remember when I was a boy growing up, Woodland Baptist Church would have buses running from Winston Salem up to the state line in Cana, Virginia. Yep. I'd say, Lord, have mercy. And then I'd think, you know what? And I'm, I'm just a dumb little snot-nosed boy. I don't understand that. Didn't realize. Might not be nobody else inviting them people to church. Yep. Right. Nowhere does it tell us that the sign of being a child of God is to talk in tongues, <coughs> to jump the pews, mm -hmm. have your eyes roll back in your head, or to do this, it says you will be witnesses. Amen. And for a lot of us, and I said, us, if our witnessing was used as evidence against us in a court of law, very few of us would be convicted of being Christians. Mm -hmm. We got that isolation. We want to stay off by ourselves. Let somebody else worry about it. And what gets me is I've, I've, I've talked to families and they say, oh, preacher, me and mine saved. I ain't worried about nobody else. Mm -hmm. well, God bless you. Luke chapter 11, Jesus is telling a parable. He invited people in and they wouldn't come. This one had this excuse. This one had that excuse. This one was doing this and this one was doing that. So the Lord said to the servant, go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in at my house might be full. Mm -hmm. Go out and beg them. Go out and plead with them. Go out and even try to force them to come in. Tell them why that's important. Tell them why they need to come into the house of God. That's all right. I ain't done with my first one yet. I got three more. <laughs> we got choir practice, but it stays a light later, right? <laughs> Go out in the highways and hedges. You, you know, preacher, they, they some of these people, if, if we was to bring them in, they might not be able to put nothing in the offering. I don't care. Right. Amen. Amen. Preacher, they might come in and they might be to the point that even when they leave, they steal and roll the toilet paper out of the back. I don't care. Amen. Amen. No, I ain't lost my mind. I found it. Jesus talking about woman at the well in John chapter 4. She heads back to town to go get the crowd. Mentioned her this morning. Here comes the disciples. He said, they come in. Lord, you need to eat. He said, I've got meat to eat that you know not of. Wonder who fed him? Who brought him that? Who, who brought him? He said, don't you look down there. Mm -hmm. 
He said, Say not ye that there are yet four months left to harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes. Look on the fields, for they're white already to harvest. We look around. And I ain't trying to be ugly. And if she has to edit this before it goes on the radio, she can edit it if she wants to. I hope she don't. But last time I called Muhammad a raghead terrorist pedophile, they got upset down there. But anyhow, <laughs> they just heard it again. We got a Catholic here that won't come and won't hear the truth. Mm -hmm. Had a Catholic live right over yonder and wouldn't hear the truth. One right across the road that will not come. Yep. Some down yonder in that holler, and y'all know they've been drug issues down there, still won't come. Live in that trailer right down there and won't come. Right next door and will not come. Yep. Next door down, will not come. Next door down, will not come. And it ain't the fact that they don't come here, they're not going anywhere. You say, well, preacher, what do you do? Bless God, how many times did God convict you of your sins before you got saved? Did he convict you one time and that was it? No. Thank God he sent the Holy Ghost back to do it again. There's too many of us and too many churches that are living in isolation. Well, let me show you another. There's too many churches that's living in satisfaction. You say, wait, wait a minute. No, listen to me. Satis sanctification, yes. Separation, yes. Satisfaction, absolutely not. The Bible tells us in Psalm 17 that David said, I shall be satisfied when I awake in thy likeness. We should not ever be satisfied with our walk with Christ until we are just like Christ and we're not going to be just like Him until we get home. Amen. But we're, hey, preacher, I made it. Well, good for you. You know, sometimes I wonder, people come into the house, we act like we're doing God a favor by being here. No, we're not doing God a favor by being here. We're doing ourselves a favor by being here. Right, and we're being obedient to a holy God by being here. Right, amen. Do we understand that? <laughs> That's disobedience to not serve God. Right. And we don't have any business being satisfied until we are just like Him. And yet, we're living in a day and time of satisfaction where, hey, I think I'm doing fine. Really? Ain't none of us doing fine because the Bible still says ain't none of us good. There is a way, Proverbs 14, there is a way that seemeth right to a man. But the ends thereof are the ways of death. When you talk to lost people, they're satisfied with their condition. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm doing good. I believe in God. Well, good for you. So do the devils and they tremble. Mm -hmm. right. And yet, we go through life I like this passage of Scripture and I've heard it several times in the last several days. Philippians chapter 3, I count not myself to have apprehended. Paul said, I ain't arrived yet. Amen. I've not got there yet. But he said, that don't mean I'm going to stop. He said, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto the things which are before, I press toward the mark. For the prize of the high calling in God in, G in Christ Jesus. What do you mean you press forward? You can't press forward doing this. Right. Can't do it. And Jesus even said, no man that puts his hand to the plow and looks back is worthy of the kingdom of God. Right. You can't press forward if you're looking this way. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. Don't, I would tell you to try this, but don't try it. I'm living proof of it. I have this tendency when I'm driving, if she says something, I'll look over at her. You know where the car goes? Yep. And sometimes I don't know it until I'm cleaning out a side ditch. <laughs> now, I'm, I ain't being funny. I'm serious. That's what happens. Yeah. 
the direction you're looking is not the direction you're going. Yeah. Paul said, I'm pressing forward toward the mark. I ain't satisfied with where I'm at now. I ain't arrived yet. I'm not going to quit yet. I'm going to keep right on going. I'm not, I, look, listen, that's what we ought to be doing, but most churches today, we're satisfied with where we're at. Look around you. What's the average age in here? Mm -hmm. You say, well, preacher, as long as the church is here till I die, you... Do you honestly think that George Farmer wanted this church to die with him? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No! And I know I mentioned it's been several months back about some of these churches that were huge in the United States and that the men of God were straight up Forest Hills down in Atlanta. <clears throat> Curtis Hudson pastored that church, built it, had the largest Sunday school in the United States of America. And what happened? Mm -hmm. Go! They don't even have church anymore. Mm -hmm. Chattanooga, Tennessee, Highland Park Baptist Church, Dr. Lee Robertson. Mm -hmm. Huge! Yeah. Had the college out there with the church, and now the church has gone stupid, yep. and so is the college. Yeah. Right. Let me tell you something. I know y'all think I'm crazy. But I got a plaque at the house that I like. And I don't put it out in the living room. We've got it sitting in there in the office. But we actually got a plaque sometime back from the farmer family, believe it or not, mm -hmm. that said thank you for still preaching it and sticking to the old ways. Right. So you need to back off and change a little bit. No, sir. Listen to me. Listen to me. The train might be just getting ready to change tracks. Right. You say, well, I'll just get off the train. You can get off the train and get a new engineer. It don't matter. Go ahead. I ain't satisfied with looking out over a crowd and there's more empty seats than there are forward. You ought to be. Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 6 says, Therefore, leaving mm -hmm. the principles of the doctrine of Christ. You say, what do you mean? He said, let us go on unto perfection. You know, we, a, a, a preacher, when, when there's a crowd that everybody's made a profession and everybody says that they're saved, a preacher shouldn't have to preach the atoning blood of Christ. Right. A preacher shouldn't have to preach. Listen to me now. Oh, you get the gospel before it's over with. But when the only people that are in the church house are saved, you shouldn't have to worry about preaching the, just, just the gospel. You ought to be able to preach on how to live, yeah. where we're at, and what yeah. we're supposed to do. Yeah. Let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. If you're here tonight and you're saved, nobody should ever tell you that you've got to be saved by faith in Christ. Because y'all should already know that. But, we still, and again, don't take what I'm about to say wrong. I won't ever get tired of hearing the song, Jesus loves me, this I know. I love that song. We all need to be reminded of it. But we should not have to hear every service that Jesus loves us. We ought to know that. We ought to know that. Paul said, I have fought a good fight and I have finished my course. I've kept the faith. You cannot finish your course if you're just going to be satisfied with where you're at right now. Amen. Because you ain't pressing toward the mark. You're standing still or sitting still. Yep. You say, well, preacher, the devil fights so hard. Well, dig in like a bulldog and say, come on. I hate the song, Go Rest High. I guess it's called, I hear it so blasting much. I hate it. I don't know what people sung before that. But I hate that song. Mm -hmm. But there's one line in that song, one line in that song that I like. And that line is, you're not afraid, you weren't afraid to face the devil. 
And let me tell you something tonight. I don't care who you are tonight. If you're a born again saved child of God, you ought to be able. You ought to be afraid to face the devil. Remember what I said back at the beginning, Matthew 28. Go ye therefore teach all nations. You know what he ends out with? Lo, I'm with you always. You know what he said right before that? He said, "I have all power in heaven and earth." And if he's got all power in heaven and earth, and he's with me. Guess what? Why do I need to be afraid? Thank God, put on the whole armor of God, get it covered, and go at it. So too many people today are, are more concerned. They like that isolation. They like that satisfaction. And, and i got a fancy word here. They want pretty oration. And you say, what do you mean? They want pretty speeches. Lord bless your heart. <laughs> Ain't God good? Well, you know what? You might not accept Jesus as Savior, but it ain't my place to judge you. I think God's going to let you in. That's what happened to Billy Graham before he died. Yeah. Amen, preacher. Right. Yes, sir. That's what we want. We want it pretty. We don't want the whole counsel of God. We love for God so loved the world mm -hmm. that He gave His only begotten Son. But when He tells us what we need to do to live, oh, preacher, you're preaching on things now you need to back up. Paul wrote to church at Corinth in chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians and said, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not unto you in excellency of speech or of wisdom. Y'all know me, I'll murder the king's English. And that's okay. I don't mind that so bad. I'll put my ain'ts and I'll put my ewanses and I'll put my y'alls and that's alright. I don't worry about that. Amen. Paul said, I came not to you in excellency of speech or wisdom declaring unto you the testimony of God. My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. See, man's wisdom will tell you that book's a lie. Man's wisdom will tell you there's no way that book can be true. Man's wisdom will tell you there's no way Christ was born of a virgin. Man's wisdom will tell you he's still in a tomb over there dead somewhere. Man's wisdom will tell you he ain't coming back. Man's wisdom will tell you we're all good and everything's going to be just fine. When the Word of God tells us there is none good and there's none righteous, no, not one. Yeah. Amen. I came not to you with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and the power that's the kind of preaching we need. Right. Mm -hmm. Now you hear me. I've seen men that could stay just as calm as they could stay and stand right here and you knew the power of God was on them. Yes. You say, well, why don't you do that? I had a crazy deacon's wife tell my wife one time, she said, you need to nail his shoes to the floor. And she said, no, I don't or he'll come out of it. <laughs> and you don't want that. Listen to me. Just because it's different styles don't mean one's better than the other or one's wrong than the other. But if we're staying in the book, God bless you, you need to listen to it. Amen. Paul said, I ain't worried about coming to you with pretty words. I'm not worried about coming to you to make you feel good. I already told Timothy, don't worry about tickling their ears. Don't worry about powdering their bottom. Right. Give them the word of God and give it to them straight. Right. Right. He said, I told Titus the same thing. I told him, preach the things that become sound doctrine. And that's exactly what every one of us needs. I don't care whether I'm up here or whether I'm sitting in a pew listening. I know we was in revival a couple of weeks ago. And I have seen preachers go behind Brother Tony. And they would. They'd try to do damage control. And they'd say, well... You know, he is what he is, and he is like he is. I still subscribe to the sword of the Lord. Had the privilege several times to meet Brother Shelton Smith. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you this. But Brother Tony was preaching one time at the sword conference. Brother Shelton Smith said, Tony, you need to hold it down just a little bit. Tony turned around and said, you knew how I was before you invited me here. <laughs> he said, what's your point? I'll tell you what the point is. I ain't apologizing for a blessed thing he said that week. Amen. Not a word. Right. 
He said, I'm not going to tell you something just to make it sound pretty. I'm not going to throw out them five all the words just to make you think I'm educated or I'm smart. He said, I'm going to give you what God gives me. And we need to understand that. See, that's what he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 when he was talking about the gospel. He said, for I delivered unto you what was given to me. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what a man of God ought to do is give to the people what God gives him. Even the apostle Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 2, for when they speak great swelling words of vanity. Vanity. It means nothing, but it sounds real pretty. That's just like if somebody sets something down before you to eat and it's nasty and it tastes terrible and you don't like it. Well, this is interesting. <laughs> I, I don't think I've ever had anything like this before. They're empty words, yep. but you're not committing to anything. Yeah. Right. Okay? I'll tell you very plainly. You die without Jesus Christ, you're going to hell and ain't no ifs, ands, buts, and back. Right. For they speak great swelling words of vanity and they allure through the lusts of the flesh through much wantonness. Tell me what I want to hear. And I can tell you now, whatever it is you want to hear, you can find it in Wall and Code. Mm -hmm. You can. Mm -hmm. No matter where you go, you can find it. You can find it. Oh, we got so many choices around here. Whether you're a Calvinist and you don't want to make a choice and you want to blame God if you die and go to hell. See, that's why, that's why I think a lot of people are Calvinists. That's why I think a lot of them are primitive Baptists and Presbyterians. If I go to hell, it ain't my fault. God chose it. No. No. Choose you this day who you're going to serve. Uh-uh. People like that lust of the flesh. I want to be able to do what I want to do. Well, go on up to the Good Shepherd Catholic Church and then come on back home and drink all the bourbon you want to. Mm -hmm. Roger used to work with a man. He said, there's a reason they call us whiskey pagans. He said, preacher, you just being fooled. No, I told you. I know why I'm an independent fundamentalist Baptist. I know why I am. Whether y'all do or not, of course, y'all might not be anymore. God called Moses out of that burning bush. He, you go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Pharaoh said, Lord, you know I can't talk. He said, I'm not eloquent. He said, I'm slow of speech. And God said, Who made your mouth? <laughs> Who made your mouth? He said, Aaron's coming. I'll let Aaron do the talking. But who did the talking when it came right down to it? Mm -hmm. It was Moses that it went up before Pharaoh. And finally Pharaoh said, don't you let me see your face again. If you do, you're going to die. He said, okay. You just called it, Pharaoh. You just called it. And he went back and told the people, he said, get you out of land. And you put it up for 14 days. And you make sure it's healthy. You make sure there's nothing wrong with it. Because at the midnight hour, God Himself is going to come through the land of Egypt. Mm -hmm. And it don't matter whether it's the, house, the firstborn of Pharaoh sitting on the throne or whether it's the lowest maid servant that there is behind the barn. Man and beast, if the blood's not applied, the firstborn of every household is going to die. Well, Pharaoh called him back that time. Get out. Get out! Take the people with you. He made it plain. He made it abundantly clear. Moses said, that's all right. Here's what's coming. See, everything that Moses said came to pass. And I'm here to tell you today, folks. You might not like the way I say it. You might not like the, 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 some of my styles. But I'm telling you now, Jesus Christ, the righteous, is coming back one of these days. Right? He's coming in the clouds and He's going to call His church home. And if you ain't saved by the grace of God, you're going to be left behind. Yes, and you're going to face the worst times this earth has ever seen. And then, then, at the end of that, you'll be cast into the lake of fire. Nothing but weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. So people want to be have that isolation. They want to have that satisfaction. They want to have that nice oration. They want to have those pretty words. 
But then, how do you build a church? How do you construct it? The Bible tells us how to construct it, but I'm afraid too many times that people are trying to build one by misconstruction. You say, what's your point? I'll tell you what my point is. If you was to go out and dig a foot, you get ready to build a building. You ain't going to go buy a truckload of Play-Doh and put down in that hole to start laying the blocks on it. You're going to start something solid. Number one, if the church ain't built on the rock, it ain't built right. right. Amen. But how do you build and how do you grow a church? We see so many examples in Scripture where they are built incorrectly. They are misconstructed. And when you look at them, we see in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, we see the church of Pergamos is the church of Balaam. You said, so what's wrong with that? Balaam was a prophet. Balaam was a prophet that tried to get Moab to intermarry with the nation of Israel to weaken the nation of Israel. Well, the Moabites have been destroyed. Okay? Today's day and time, mix the world with the church. And you weaken the church. Yep. And that's what's happened. Y'all see what you want to. You know, lights, camera, action. It's not a video production. This is not a show. This is... They say there's no business like show business anymore. There's no business like church business, I don't think. Right. I see it. I look at it once in a while just to, just to see some of that on television just to look at it and say, my God, please, Lord, let us keep enough sense for we ain't going to something like that. Yeah. We don't need the strobe lights. We don't need to bring the world in. We don't need a rock band. Church of Pergamos is that church of Balaam. When you look at the church of Thyatira, you got the church of Jezebel. Mm -hmm. Dude, what's your point? Hey, what the point is. When you get that, you got the well. Yep. <laughs> you got First Christian Church. Yep. Come on. Mm -hmm. Come on. You say, preacher, I got family that goes down there. Then you need to do your dead level best to get them out. Right. Right. Get them out from under them so-called women preachers and get them under. Mm -hmm. Get them under a man of God. Amen. You said you're being offensive. Well, skip it. <laughs> That's just the way it is. So you never know. And I heard a preacher say this yesterday. You never know when the last time you're in the pulpit is going to be your last time in the pulpit. So you better make it count. Right. Y'all, if I die tonight, y'all won't remember this. And the church of Sardis is the church of the dead. You got a reputation that you live, but you're dead. Mm -hmm. Ain't nothing happening. We come in and take a pulse and we wouldn't get anything. Blood pressure be zero over zero. Ain't no life. That tells me there ain't no Christ. Because in Him was life and that life was the light of man. Then you look at the church at Laodicea which is just flatly the church of no God. We ain't got nothing but a social club. And I'm going to just say this. Bless your heart, people. Listen, I, I, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart. Don't just come here because it's, it's, you, you've done it for years. Don't just come out of habit. Don't come just to be seen. Don't come just so you can get all the gossip. Don't come just so you can see what such and such is wearing. That ain't no reason to come to the house of God. Right. Amen. I'm about done. In the book of Amos, 
And I'm finishing up. In the book of Amos, he begins to talk about, and I know it, I don't, I don't want to take this out of context, but the book of Amos, he's trying to talk about how to bring the nation of Israel back because he says there in chapter 4, he says, I've done all this and because you wouldn't return to me, Israel, prepare to meet thy God. Mm -hmm. But up in the upper part of that chapter, he begins to talk and he said, I've brought famine. I've brought no rain. I cause it to not rain over here and over here it does rain. You say, what are you saying, preacher? Well, I'm going to give you a Stokes County translation. In this church over here, it's dry as dust. This one over here, God's letting down the shower blessings. Mm -hmm. And people will say, well, you know what? That old preacher we got, he's just dry as dust. He's upsetting me. He makes me mad every time he opens his mouth. I don't want to hear what he's got to say. I'm going to go over here where they're having a good time. And then you know what happens? Mm -hmm. You get over there and you kill that church too. Mm -hmm. Now hear what I'm saying. I'll be the first to tell you I know God leads people. Yeah. But there ain't no such thing as a butterfly Christian. Amen. You know butterflies and hummingbirds they go from bloom to bloom. Mm -hmm. God leads you to a church. Thank God. Get at it and get in it. Go at it. But church hoppers ain't no way to build a church. That's right. Okay. Church growth is caused by verse number 47 in Acts chapter 2. Mm -hmm. Praising God and having favor with all the people, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. How does a church grow? It grows because of saving grace and people being born into the family of God. Amen. In Acts 2.41, 3,000 souls are saved. In Acts 4, 4, 5,000 souls are saved. Mm -hmm. right. That's the way churches are built. That's the way biblical church growth takes place. I know a preacher right now that made the statement he was going to shut down a certain church. I'll have all their members. I'll have them up here and that church will be shut down. And I just shook my head. And I said, you out of the will of God? You out of the will of God? Mm -hmm. We can live in isolation, not want to have anything to do with anybody outside these walls. We can live in satisfaction and say, hey, hey, preacher, I'm happy right where I'm at. Well, they ain't none of us got there yet. They ain't none of us arrived yet. They ain't none of us apprehended. Right. We can just decide we want a particular style of oration and say, hey, I want them pretty words. I want, I want to feel good when I leave the house. Now, let me tell you something. If I was lost and got saved, I'd feel pretty good when I left. Mm -hmm. Or if I come in and I was out of the will of God and the preacher showed that to me and I got right with God, I'd feel pretty good when I left. Mm -hmm. But we can have a misconstruction and try to wrote try to grow one the right way. I ain't trying to be ugly, but I've seen churches have their... Listen to me now. Listen to what I'm saying. I got no problem, and that's why I, I like these... I like I like our chicken stew in the fall. We invite the community in. You say, preacher, we ain't got... A, well, at least, bless God, they know that they're welcome. Mm -hmm. yeah. Something might take root. <coughs> Have a fun day or something during the summer and invite them in. At least they know that it's welcome. You don't go out and say, hey, if you'll leave it. I used to know a man that lived in Texas and he said that there was a fellow down there that owned the oil well. And man, football was like church in Texas. It still is. High school football. Some of their stadiums are bigger than Wake Forest Stadium is. But he said, that man that owned that oil well went three counties over because there's a quarterback over there at a high school. And he said he went over there and he talked to the boy's daddy and said, y'all need to move over here because we need that boy in our high school to play football. 
He said, man, I've got a job over here making good money. He said, don't worry about that. I'll pay you three times what you're making. Just move your family over here. <laughs> Satan will be selling ice water in hell before I go to another church and try to drag somebody out of that church and bring them. Amen. 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 That ain't how you build a church. Right. How do you build it? You go out into the highways and hedges and tell them to come in so that his house can be full. Right. So church, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? I'm going to give it probably till the 1st of May. 1st of May, this station is going to start on a regular organized basis. If you ain't coming, that's you know that's between you and the Lord. But I'm going to say this right now. I don't care who you are. I don't care how you take this. If this church ain't worth you inviting people to, it ain't worth you being here. Right. All right. So if you don't come, you don't come. That's between you and God. But it's going to begin. You said, preacher, they might not nobody come. You know what? That's a good possibility. But here's what I do know. When Philip was in Samaria preaching that revival, and the crowds were coming, they were getting saved, people were moving, getting close to God, and the Spirit of the Lord said, Oh, Philip, you need to leave. I need you to go down to Gaza. Well, what? No, he didn't. He went. Mm -hmm. He didn't pull a Jonah. He went. You said, the preacher, there wasn't, there wasn't but one Ethiopian unit. They got saved. And do you know that for hundreds of years, Ethiopia was the largest Christian nation in Africa? Mm -hmm. That started by one Ethiopian unit getting saved. Philip being obedient to God to go to Gaza, preach to him Jesus. He went back home rejoicing. Don't tell me he didn't tell somebody else. Because mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you something. I, I'm going to say this again. If you don't, know, if you don't like it, that's fine too. If God the Almighty has saved your soul and you don't think enough of Him to tell somebody what He's done in your life, there's something wrong. Amen. Now we look at this and you say, Preacher, what kind of invitation are you going to give? I'll tell you what I'm going to give. Or we're going to go out into the highways and hedges or we're going to just go ahead and wait for all the old people in here to die and then shut the doors. Mm. Because that will happen. Mm -hmm. That will happen. My great granddaddy passed from the church from Piney Creek, North Carolina, up in Allegheny County for a lot of years, but today the doors are closed. The last time I saw him preach was either 98 or 99. But he could still plow the coin. Still plow the coin. He had a cane in both hands to stand steady. But he was still preaching. And today the doors are closed. You want that to happen here? One of these, you say, well, preacher, I'll be dead and gone. It won't matter. Yeah, well, what about your children and your grandchildren? Mm -hmm. If you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus, then what I've said so far don't mean a blessed thing to you. But I will tell you this. If you don't know Jesus, the Bible still says that for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You can't get saved tonight and be a part of this. Right. Mm -hmm. You say, preach, I'm a born again child of God, but I just don't know so much about all this visiting and witnessing and telling people. And Well, you're out of the will of God, and I'm closing it right, right. there. Mm -hmm. Father, thank you for the privilege of being able to be back in your house tonight. And I thank you for the opportunity for us to come and meet together and worship together. I thank you, Father, for allowing us the opportunity to look at a portion of your word. And God, I pray tonight I said exactly what you'd have me to say and pray that I said it in the right way. God, I know tonight it ain't enough for us to just stay inside these four walls. It ain't enough for us to be satisfied where we're at. It ain't enough for us just to want to hear sweet words and have our ears tickled. It ain't enough for us just to go out and get people from other churches to keep this one going. No, God, help us tonight 
to get a burden for people that are not in church, people who are not in the family of God, people who when they take their last breath, if they don't make a change, they're going into the devil's head. Help us tonight. Help me tonight. The church is to grow. <clears throat> Father, your word says by people getting saved. Help us be that light. Help it to shine and let people see that need for a Savior. Have your way. And God, if there is anybody in this place that does not know Jesus, I pray tonight, God, that you just touch their heart. If there's somebody listening tonight, God, let them realize that wherever they're at right now, they can be born into the family of God. But God, help us tonight to let that light shine. Help us tonight to be the witness we ought to be. And help us tonight, God, that when the words preach, we just take it just like it says. Have your way in this invitation for what you do. We'll thank you. We'll praise you. We'll give you the honor and the glory if we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.